Hey there, movie fans. Yes, we are back on FYC with movies. It is Oscar season. The Emmys have just happened, and we are back into our comfort zone. This is very exciting for Oscar season. The 95th Academy Awards will take place on March 12th, 2023, and we have a whole lot of episodes of FYC to keep you excited up until that moment. What will win Best Picture? Well, we are going to start off big by predicting the Oscar nominees, all 10 Oscar nominees for Best Picture. Joining me as always on our brand new season of Film FYC, the amazing Perry Nemiroff and the mighty Jeff Snyder. So first, I just want to start off, Perry, by asking, how excited are you to be back into film season? The way you described it is perfect because I very much enjoyed and loved doing Emmy season, but this feels like... It's like comfort food to yeah. me. This this just makes me happy. And looking at the list that we're about to go through today, it's just the excitement is through the roof. And uh, uh, my yeah. my assistant Malcolm is on duty. I think he's already made an appearance. So if anything falls over during this episode of FYC, you know who to blame. Absolutely. Jeff, how about you? How excited are you for film season? I'm excited because I'm much more confident. I feel like I know the Film Academy and its tastes and its weird you know, quirks a little bit better than the TV Academy. And, you know, I, I finally will have seen everything rather than being like, well, I haven't seen this and I haven't seen that, but let me try to predict it. Well, the Film Academy certainly knows you, Jeff Snyder, for better or worse. <laughs> and that is why we are back. I see uh, I see Malcolm already making an appearance. This is a brand new FYC. Absolutely, for sure, a brand new season. So we are going to, like I said, to predict our 10 best picture oscar nominees and there will be a solid 10 so let's just start with what i think and i'm sure you both think and everyone thinks is the obvious choice perry what is in your number one slot for best it's picture nomination definitely the fablemans it is a really good movie it is a steven spielberg movie it won the audience award at tiff and it also is a big celebration of cinema and storytelling everything is working in this movie's favor right now. So it is my number one. And I'm pretty confident in saying this is a lock for a Best Picture nomination. Absolutely agree. Jeff, what's your take on The Fablemans? Is it the number one choice right now? Is it the number one contender, even though we still have like six months to go? Absolutely. I think that viewers will probably get sick of us uh, talking about The Fablemans because I just don't really see a lot of competition on the horizon for that. Uh, so it is very clearly entrenched in my number one. Um, obviously, there's some late breaking movies later this year that, you know, we'll see if it you know can knock it off. But yeah, I think Fablemans is very clearly going to run away with this. Well, it has been a while since Steven Spielberg won a, an Academy Award for Best Director. That was Saving Private Ryan from 1998. Uh, he also won for Best Director and for Best Picture for Chandler's List back in 1993. And you know what? I feel like after Spielberg's timing for when West Side Story hit theaters, which was right when Omicron was like gearing up, so now he is back less than a year later with a film that really plays to his strengths. It is sort of very, very autobiographical for him. It is a love letter movies, all the things that both of you said that, uh, and for many other reasons that it is the number one front runner for a best picture nomination and maybe even to win, but you know, we'll get there. And I just want to say that our list is going to include obviously the films that we saw, at these film festivals and earlier this year, but also films that we have not seen. So we're jumping the gun, just going with some of the hype and, and anticipation for upcoming films. So with that, Jeff, what is your second prediction for a Best Picture nomination? They called me crazy, Scott, man. They said, Jeff Snyder, he's lost his touch. He doesn't know what he's talking about. But number two is Top Gun Maverick. Okay, well, just so you know, that's my number two as well. And they always say that about you anyway, Jeff, but we love you. <laughs> we love you anyway. Okay, yep. why is Top Gun Maverick number two on your list like it is for mine? I just thought it was a great movie. I rewatched it. It totally held up. Tom Cruise is charming like no other. Like, this is the kind of blockbuster that, that that's why they, they made it 10 nominations. You know, this is, I know we say that every year about one superhero movie or another, but like, Re, like seriously top gun maverick is definitely getting in this year uh and i think paramount is ready for the campaign too 
I, I agree. Perry, what do you think? Is, is Top Gun Maverick on your list? And if so, where is it? Can can I give away my three while discussing my two while discussing this? My two sure. and three. I mean, I guess I kind of just did it right now. So Top Gun Maverick is my number three. And I need to preface this by saying, like, I tend to get a little, a little like weird and too uncertain when it comes to putting things on this list that not only have I not seen, but no one else out there has seen. That's that's why certain ones will fall lower on my list than they might on yours. But when it comes to two movies that came out this year that did really, really well, I rank everything everywhere's chances above Top Gun Maverick, specifically right now, because I think that's the more deserving movie between the two of them. That's only that's only why Top Gun Maverick is in my three spot and not my two spot. But even though I said this when I reviewed the film that I thought it was really good, but it doesn't necessarily have best picture written all over it. Over time, I have come to change my mind on the matter, and uh, I think it is definitely going all the way and getting a nomination for Best Picture. Okay, okay, so so I have Top Gun Maverick number two on my list. Number three on my list is Everything Everywhere All at Once. And while I was putting my list together, I kept going back and forth, switching the placing of Top Gun and Everything Everywhere. Everything Everywhere, which is a, certainly a more daring film, and it is original with a capital O, whereas Top Gun Maverick, which made $1.68 billion worldwide, absolutely a fantastic movie, so much better than I think anybody expected it to be. So much better than it certainly deserves to be. But it is an outstanding movie. Like Jeff said, this is the kind of movie that is the reason why the Academy, you know, going back like 10 or 12 years ago, expanded the Best Picture nominations to up to 10 movies or now exactly 10 movies. I think this is definitely getting in. It is a beloved film. Everyone loves the movie. Certainly the audience has loved it. Critics loved it. Uh, Guild members love it as well. Just because it is a popular film, it does not mean that it shouldn't get nominated for Best Picture. To that extent, I feel like Top Gun Maverick is this year's Titanic, a popular film that is absolutely going to make the cut, and it deserves to. But then, Perry, since you brought up your number two, which is my number three, let's talk about the amazing everything, everywhere, all at once. This movie, how I, I'm still saying this so many months after its release. How does this movie exist? How <laughs> yeah. did it work? How is it as good as it is? It's not just one of the most memorable cinematic experiences for me in 2022. It, it probably is of all time. I have never seen anything quite like this. And one of the most special things about this movie is how, you know, I always appreciate when a film has that effect on me and it's my experience, but the fact that that did that to such a wide audience out there and we were all able to share in it together when it was re released theatrically and then again digitally, that's a really special experience that, you know, really deserves to be honored with an award like this or a nomination like this at least, even though... I feel like if you want to go with the more traditional uh, definition of a Best Picture nominee, maybe it doesn't fall into that category because of how bold, daring, and just like totally unique the movie is. But yeah. that to me is what Best Picture nominations represent. So I am yeah. very excited to have it so high on my list right now. Well, let's let's when we are we are in a world where where a movie like Parasite overcame 1917 to win the Academy Award for Best Picture, plus three other awards, including Screenplay Director, International Feature. So so I think that the, it really broke a ceiling for a movie like Everything Everywhere to get in. And, you know, when I when I saw Everything Everywhere at its world premiere at South by Southwest, I just knew that this was the beginning of something special. It's domestic gross for Everything Everywhere is $70 million. It is the biggest movie in the history of A24. The worldwide gross is $155.7 million. Jeff, where on your list is Everything Everywhere all at once? Same as you, Mr. Mance, number yeah. three. Uh, again, it's just a matter of the other contenders really not living up to expectations. Everything everywhere I thought was good. Um, it didn't work for me 100%. I think it's a little too goofy to maybe go all the way this year, but it really sticks the landing. Um, oh, yeah, it does. And, and it, you know, it's, it's a great ending. Uh, there's real emotion in this film, and it really gets you kind of questioning – you know, larger themes of, of life. Um, Michelle Yeoh is fantastic. So I do think 
after maybe being initially skeptical, like, you know, back in the spring, being, oh, no, there's a zillion Oscar contenders. This will be lucky to make the cut. No, I think that this is going to get in there uh, pretty easily. It is one of the great box office success stories of the year. And people, you know, clearly have true affection and fondness for this film. Well, when we were doing one of our Oscars or or any FYC shows, Jeff, I think you made the comment that just because the end of the year might not be as strong as prior years for Oscar contenders, some films that may or may not have made the cut are now going to be a lock to make the cut for a Best Picture nomination. And I agree that Everything Everywhere, even though it's absolutely deserving, maybe in prior years it would have been too too far out to do so but i think you're you know you're looking at best picture director screenplay certainly best actress for michelle yo and even ki hoi kwan for supporting actors so this is an absolute contender i think our top three are extremely solid so with that perry what's your number four I, I'll preface this by saying, I, like, I'm so uncertain with the rest of these movies. <laughs> yeah. I have changed the order a million times at this point, but I, I think the next. I'm so torn on this. <laughs> I think I'm gonna go with women talking next. I, I saw that at TIFF, and I was, I was curious how I would respond to it because it's a very dialogue heavy film, and it really is heavily on that ensemble. And then also Sarah Polly as a director to bring the most out of her actors, but also keep those visuals dynamic so that you kind of up the intensity as that conversation continues and they ultimately make their decision. And I was really pretty blown away by how successful that team is at doing that. So I'm going to go with women talking. And I also think that this one is going to get a good deal of recognition beyond this category as well. Okay. I agree with you that it will get recognition beyond this category, which was why I have to say that once I get past my top five, my list is really kind of fuzzy. And I have yes. I have women talking on my fuzzy list for that reason. Not that I don't think it's going to get nominated, but it's kind of fuzzy for me at the moment. So we'll have to see if this conversation makes me put it put it in pen. Jeff, do you have women talking on your list of Oscar Best Picture contenders? I'm going to say that's a no. Yeah, that's a no. I don't. And I and I and I acknowledge that it probably is in the top five of like you know actual contenders, but part of my brain. It just won't let me put it on there because I just did not like it at all. I think a lot of people are going to not like it at all. But you know what? Power of the Dog was like the front runner last year. So is that is, is you know, that movie this year's Power of the Dog potentially. But right now, with enough movies that I haven't seen yet, I, I can't put it on. Well, I, listen, I, I saw it at Telluride and the movie is absolutely lives up to its name. It's women talking in a barn <laughs> and the performances are great. This, the, 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 the conversation is extremely topical and relevant by today's standards. And, and Sarah Polly is an Oscar nominee for writing uh, 2007's uh, Away From Her, which is an, an amazing, amazing film. And I think that she'll get nominated a, in a screenplay category as a lock before she gets a lock as a best picture nominee. I don't know yet. We'll, we'll have to see how this conversation continues to go. Uh, Jeff, what is next number four on your list? So I'm glad that you asked me that when you did, because this is almost a symbolic placeholder, you know, a fill in for women talking. And okay. that's she said, I have, she said sight unseen at number four because it's about the Harvey Weinstein case which clearly, you know, everyone in Hollywood has strong opinions on. And if they can, they don't even, it doesn't even have to be a knockout like Spotlight. But if it's just like in the ballpark, I think it's going to be I, just like, how do you ignore this movie? Um, so, so sight unseen, that's why I have, um, she said over women talking. But like if she said just, you know, ends up being a kind of average like bombshell Kind yep. of maybe, maybe right. then I put women talking back on the list. You know what I mean? That's a really, really great comparison. What she said could either be Spotlight, which makes it an absolute contender, or it could be like Bombshell, which is solid but not outstanding. Uh, I have it on my list at number six. Again, sight unseen. It's the closing night of the New York Film Festival. So, so Perry, if you're going to be there, you'll see it on October 13th, uh, which is the closing night of New York. But... Do you have, she said, sight unseen on your list? 
I will not be in New York that long, but Man. also I do not have it on my list. And that that's one of those movies where I'm like not writing it off completely, but I am very hesitant to include it on my list, having absolutely no sense of what even other people think about the movie. Whereas, you know, I'll, I'll spoil one later on and I'll bring it up now because it's an obvious uh, topic that we're going to talk about. Whereas with Babylon and the folks involved in that film their academy award track record i'm a little more willing to give that movie a shot right now before seeing it before hearing what anybody else sees it before she said okay well i have both of those movies on my list both she said and babylon both of those movies are sight unseen i, I think said, that's a fair point that perry makes though that, that she said doesn't necessarily have the pedigree and i also wonder what is the appetite that Hollywood has to have another award season where we're talking about Harvey Weinstein effectively. Well, well, listen, this is coming from a big studio. She said is opening on November 18th and it's about the two New York times reporters who blew open the Harvey Weinstein story. And of course launched the me too movement. So, so coming from a, from a major studio, having uh, actors like Carrie Mulligan and Zoe Kazan play the leads, the New York times reporters, Again, you know, sight unseen, it could be a bombshell. Uh, I mean, in terms of like the movie that it is, which is, you know, a very good film, but it just didn't really, really break through, even though the message was important. And that too was a movie that was very much about the Me Too movement. But is my it on, number, yeah, go is ahead. It on, is it on your list, Mance? Well, she, uh, she said, said it's number six on my list. Okay. Okay. But my number four, thank you very much, is Elvis. Elvis. I thought was fantastic. I've seen it twice. I think it is it is Baz Luhrmann's most accessible film because if you if you think he goes too far too much with the hyperkinetic editing and the uh, you know whether it's Great Gatsby or Moulin Rouge, this is much more scaled back and restrained for Baz Luhrmann. But also, uh, I, I mean, I thought Austin Butler was fantastic as Elvis, I and mean, he's going to get nominated for Best Actor. But Elvis made $151 million domestically, $286 million worldwide. It is a great film. You don't even need to be a huge, crazy Elvis fan to love the movie. I, I, I think it is uh, certainly the production values, maybe director, certainly costume design and all that stuff. It'll get nominated. Perry, is Elvis on your list? For the record, I still have to actually circle back and watch Elvis. So this assessment is based on what I've heard from. I know it was like it was a crazy week. I think I went to a, a film festival or something and missed my screening and then never went back. But anyway, it is not on my list. Oh, and geez. it's when I'm thinking about movies that came out earlier in the year and they're big studio releases that are more, you know, I guess in the blockbuster category, I give the edge to movies like Everything Everywhere and Top Gun Maverick. Whereas Elvis, while I do think it's somewhat in the conversation, I think over time it's going to wind up getting bumped out by whatever is left that could be a contender through the rest of the year. And wow. I, do, I know there's a lot of very enthusiastic people out there about the movie, but then I also know it did face a, a good deal of criticism as well. Well, so while I'm not completely knocking Elvis out of the conversation in the back of my mind, it is not on my list just yet. Jeff, how about you? Is Elvis on your list? Oh my God, you guys are crazy. You guys are nuts. I, I, thought, I mean, may, may, and maybe you're right. Um, I thought it was very good. I thought it was like a B plus movie, but you know, other than that last five minutes, I, I don't really see the greatness there. The, the last five minutes, w w the movie kicked into another gear, but. Yeah, I, I just, um, I don't know that this was like, it was just very conventional, I felt like, as a biopic. Again, he is great, but the Tom Hanks performance, I think, throws some people off. Like, uh, I just don't know if I see it, especially like getting in that high on the list. Like, I'm, I'm maybe at nine or ten, Scott, but... Well, listen, I, I, I understand your points. I disagree with them. I think that, by again, by Boss Lerman standards, it is a conventional film, but it is not a conventional film... Uh, like a bio, like, like a straightforward biopic by any means. It is still very high, highly stylized. It's filled with urgency and energy and just a lot of inspiration. And I think, uh, you know, especially, I mean, not that, not that a lot of Academy of vote, voters live in like the flyover states, but it has certainly resonated throughout the country, which is why a movie like this has done so very well domestically. Uh, you don't gonna, hear that like it's just going to be sort of dismissed as like, well, that's a great performance, oh, but the movie is just good. OK, no, I, I think that that because of the production values, the production design, uh, you know, the, the hair, the makeup, the costumes, the editing, certainly the editing, there are so many crafts 
artisan, you know, sort of below the line as we used to call it. Now we call it crafts categories in which the film will excel. And I think that will absolutely push it into the best picture category, along with the the lead actor nomination that uh, Austin Butler is bound to get. So let's keep that as a question mark. And Perry, you brought up Babylon, sight unseen. It is on my list at number five. It is directed by La La Land Oscar winner, Damon Chazelle. Yes, big fan. But regardless, this movie stars Brad Pitt and Margot Robbie in 1920s Hollywood as Hollywood makes the transition from silent films to talkies. The movie is R-rated. It's allegedly, from what I've heard, about three hours long. Uh, the trailer did drop. So, Jeff, I'm going to ask you first, just based on what you saw from that trailer or at TIFF, or because uh, I know they had a presentation there, or at even CinemaCon, what's your take on Babylon so far? Do you think that Damon Chazelle will, quote, unquote, do it again? I'm a little nervous about it. I have some reservations. Uh, I, I love Whiplash. I love La La Land. I, I think that he is... Brilliant. And I think that Sight Unseen, you know, you do have to have it in that top tier of contenders. Yep. Um, but the trailer, I don't know, looked a little messy. It looked a little like hard to get a handle on it. Uh, it looked also a little decadent. Um, I know Hollywood loves, you know, true stories about itself and, and you know, it has a great cast and everything. But uh, I just I didn't love First Man. And, and I wonder if he's almost chasing the Oscar a little too hard. Well, uh, fair. Uh, First Man was highly anticipated up until its debut at the, uh, Venice, and then it, you know, got unfairly criticized because it didn't show the flag being planted, which was ridiculous. I like Damien Chazelle. I I love First Man. Uh, but Perry, what did you what do you think of the chances for Babylon it's, to get nominated? It's on my list. I like that trailer. I thought like the messiness and the frenetic nature of it probably was pretty appropriate for what the movie I think is going to be ultimately. And you know, it's like what I said before, this is really the only movie that I have on my list that like not only have I not seen, but nobody has seen. So I yeah. have no sense of how good it really is. But in this particular case, because it's Damien Chazelle, I am including it on the list. And like, I know what you mean, Jeff, but I feel like it's not fair to say Damien himself is chasing the Oscar. I feel like after you deliver a movie like Whiplash and then you have the whole like run you had with La La Land, like that's what that's what Oscar packaging and like the beginning of Gold Derby is. It's like you are officially associated with your movie being an Academy Award contender. And I have to imagine that's like a whole lot of pressure to live up to literally every single time you release a new movie. Right. Yeah, I, I got to say, I, I was... I was hoping that Babylon would premiere at the trifecta of Venice, Telluride, and Toronto. It didn't. And I understand why it didn't, because when La La Land debuted at that trifecta, it had to maintain its like first place running for the next six plus months. And then at the very, very last moment, of course, it lost to Moonlight. So Paramount, which is releasing Babylon, and they are also releasing Top Gun, so they could have potentially two movies vying for best picture and that'll be interesting to see how how that all plays out but i have a lot of high hopes for babylon it was yeah. easy for me to put it on my list sight unseen uh i think it should stay and perry you you and i have it on our list so for I, that I have it on my list as well it's number six on my list all right so babylon stays so then that means jeff uh, we're running out of like actual numbers. Just what's next on your list of best picture contenders? The the number five movie uh, right now for me is The Banshees of Anna Sharon. Okay, um, let's hear it. I, I think it's just kind of like an undeniably good movie. I don't know, really know how you walk away from that movie being like, well, that wasn't good. Um, I think it's a weird movie, a, ve yeah. a very weird movie. And, and that in its weirdness is almost going to preclude it from being a serious contender. But it feels like a shoe in for a nomination. Colin Farrell's excellent. Brendan Gleeson's great. Really like Carrie Condon in support. And I know Barry Cogan's gotten good reviews as well. The Academy likes Martin McDonough. There's a segment of the Academy that really embraces his, his sense of humor. Uh, and so I think that that is safe. I agree. I'm listen. Uh, you're right. Martin McDonald is beloved by the Academy. He's a three time Oscar nominee. Original screenplay for In Bruges, in which this movie, Banshees of Annie Sharon, reunites Brendan Gleeson and Colin Farrell. He was also nominated for three billboards outside every Ebbing, Missouri for Best Picture and Original Screenplay. And he actually is an Academy Award winner for Best Short Film for the, for the short film called Six Shooter. So, Perry. Where or do you 
have Banshees on your list? I do. This is my number six. Okay. I was very sad that I could have seen it at TIFF, but I wound up with a conflict and I missed it. But I keep hearing uh, some, I mean, I keep hearing widespread praise. I actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I don't think I've heard a single person not like it. Well, I have it number nine on my list uh, only because Jeff, like you said, it's a bit, uh, I would say offbeat, uh, uh, you know, but then again, so was in Bruges in some ways. So three billboards. Uh, yeah. And three, well, three billboards. So uh, definitely was, I, I mean, I thought that movie was amazing, but I think uh, Banshees uh, definitely makes the list. So we have it, we have it uh, on, on it. We don't have to number it. All right, Perry, what's, what's your next obvious choice for best pick? My my next one would be my number five, and that's where I have Tar, which is like something else. Yep. I I really do think that Kate Blanchett might be the person to beat at this point in the best actress category. She is just like a damn force in that film, and it is it's a very long movie, but yep. you can't take your eyes off of her. Like I can't Dude. believe how much of that movie was was like the interview she does at the beginning, then the lecture she gives at Juilliard, and it's like literally just her talking. But you are sucked in. You're leaning in. You're like, what do you say? How are you doing this? And it like that feeling just keeps on going as the movie progresses. It is it's something else. And I'm curious to see how everyone reacts to it when it gets uh, when it gets out there to the public. But that's that's a pretty well done film with an exceptional performance at its core. Absolutely agree with you 100%. Kate Blanchett is in all two hours and 40 minutes of that movie. You cannot take your eyes off of her. Her performance, the screenplay written by Todd Field, who also directed. Uh, Todd Field is a three-time Academy Award nominee for Best Picture and Adapted Screenplay for In the Bedroom. And he was also nominated for Adapted Screenplay for Little Children. I think this is his boldest film yet. I'm also going to go so far as to say that Tar is Todd Field's Stanley Kubrick movie. The reason I say that is because while Todd Field was making Eyes Wide Shut with Stanley Kubrick, in which he played Nick Nightingale, the piano player with the blindfold on, he really looked up to uh, Kubrick as his mentor. And I think that uh, he mostly does knock it out of the park with Tar. It's an outstanding film, riveting, mesmerizing, a movie that I think you need to see a couple times to really like wrap your head around it. Jeff, what did you think of Tar? Is it on your list? Did you see it? I did see Tar. I saw it uh, last week. But? <laughs> she, she was amazing. But? I think that Kubrick's comparison is almost kind of spot on because Stanley Kubrick did not make Academy friendly movies. And right. I think this is the kind of movie where a lot of viewers will not be able to wait to jump out of their seat at the, after two hundred two hours and 40 minutes and escape the theater. I mean, you know, that character is a lot to take. Um, so no, I, <laughs> I, I, I think that she, you know, could very well win another Oscar, but I don't see the picture getting in. No. Uh, okay, I agree with you. I agree that it is not a movie for everybody. It is not a movie I would like recommend to like my parents or something. Uh, but I do think that because of its merits, because it's such a well-made film, I uh, and go. I mean, you know, Eyes Wide Shut was nineteen ninety nine. This is now twenty twenty two, going into twenty twenty three. I think it does make the cut. Uh, but I'm going to put it, you know, penciled in right now on our list because two out of three, me and Perry do have it on our list. Okay. I think it's awesome. I think Kate Blanchett, who's already a two time Academy Award winner, supporting actress for The Aviator and lead actress for Blue Jasmine, which is nine years old, nuts. But she is incredible in this movie. I, you love the ending. I wish What's the that? ending was stronger and then I could have maybe felt a little bit better about it. Well, the reason the reason I say you got to see it again, and I do want to see it again. That's the I'll never see that movie again. No, no, I I do want to see that again again. because because when I saw it at Telluride, I was talking to a couple people after the film, and they brought up things that I missed. Not that I missed uh, because they were obvious, but subtleties that made me go, "Oh, now I got to go back and see it." And I do want to see it again. I think it's a I think it's an awesome film. All right, moving on. Uh, I'm going to just throw this one out there. Do either of you? Have the movie Armageddon Time on your list? I haven't seen it yet. Nope. Very aware that that could sneak in there, but no, I don't. I don't have it on right now. Perry, same, same position. I'm I'm aware of it, but I am not feeling compelled to put it on my list just yet. 
Okay, I do have it on my list. I did see it. It was my favorite movie that I saw at Telluride. Uh, full disclosure, of the eight years that I've been going to Telluride, I have to say that this was the weakest slate that I experienced at Telluride. There was no obvious like front runner, like a La La Land or a Moonlight or a Parasite or a Spotlight or a film like that that made me go, yes, this is the one that's winning. But Armageddon Time is written and directed by James Gray. I really, really, really love James Gray. The Yards, Two Women. Uh, I really like that Astra, even though it kind of got away from him. He didn't get final cut on it. Uh, and he's never been nominated for Academy Award, even though he was nominated uh, or he had his movies in Cannes like five times. Uh, I really love Armageddon Time, but if you don't have it on your list and neither of you saw it, I will take it off. Just but, right now. Just for right now. But, but with the footnote that, as always, our predictions are subject to change. And over the next seven months, I am sure that they will. Okay, so Jeff, what is next on your list for Best Picture nomination? Uh, at number seven, I had Sam Mendes' Empire of Light. Did uh, you see it? I know that I did see it. Um, I know that it got some mixed reviews. Uh, but I do think that the you know the BAFTA contingent, the British voters, could really go for this in the Academy. I thought it was good. It didn't knock me out. It didn't blow me away. But I thought Olivia Coleman was fantastic. Uh, Michael Ward um, is is a really talented newcomer. And there was something I don't know it, it, that it, you know, mental illness and movies and all that kind of stuff. I don't know. There was enough for me where it could sneak in there. All right, Perry. What did you think of Empire of Light? I saw Empire of Light at TIFF. The first thing I did when I got back to my laptop was take it off of my best picture list on Gold Derby. I, I think the performances are great, but I think that movie is a mess and it's trying to way too much in a single film and it winds up doing a disservice to every single theme it's exploring. I don't think it's a very good movie and it's not going to get a Best Picture nomination. I, I, I agree, Perry. I just don't think that Empire of Light came to light. I think there are, there is there is a movie there that is just needs a, to uh, to really just like come together with one polish. And, you know, I agree. Mikhail Ward was fantastic. I mean, he was a revelation. Uh, of course, Olivia Coleman is fantastic. I think the two of them, Olivia Coleman for lead, Mikhail Ward for supporting actor is a stronger shot than, than Empire of Light getting a Best Picture nomination, especially because, you know, there is a, uh, a DNA link to Fableman's which is the front runner. And I just don't know if two movies about the magic of movies or the magic of movie theaters. Well, Plus three, Babylon. Right. right. Babylon. That's true. Right. Uh, that's I don't true. think all those movies get in. Um, but, uh, but okay. So I'm going to throw another movie out there uh, that I liked a lot. And I'm wondering what you thought of the woman King, Jeff. No, no, not getting in. Damn. Why? Uh, I mean, just wasn't good enough. I don't know. I mean, Perry, I don't see it. I haven't seen it yet, but it's on my list. I had to miss the screening because it was the day before I went to TIFF and I haven't had the chance to circle back around, but I've been hearing such good things and the, the power of Viola Davis is a very, very real thing. So I actually do have it on my list. Yeah. I mean, it's an outstanding film and Viola Davis is a, is a force to be reckoned with. Uh, I think the movie has a good shot of making the cut. But, you know, for the purposes of the rest of this conversation, I'm just going to leave it penciled in, even though Perry and I agree. Uh, but I, I did see it and I and I thought it was fantastic. I'm going to throw out a movie that I just literally saw the other day. And it was the movie that won the Palme d'Or, the top prize at the Cannes Film Festival. The movie is called Triangle of Sadness. It's written and directed by Ruben Ostlund, who also directed the 2017 Palme d'Or winner, The Square. I got to tell you both and everybody watching this movie really was a wild, far out, disturbing and unnerving film. Very, very provocative. And I got to say, after the White Lotus really took charge of the Emmys a few weeks ago, this movie has a lot of similarities to it about class structure about uh, class snobbery, about entitlement and privilege, role reversals. Uh, there is a mid scene in the film that takes place on a yacht during a storm where everybody gets seasick. And I, I mean, 
I, I can't remember the last time a movie just sort of stayed with me in such an unnerving way, but it is a very, very, very good film. Now, now the square, which was nominated or won the Palme d'Or did not get nominated for best picture. So I'm wondering if triangle of sadness, even though it did win the Palme d'Or, if it might be just too far out or it might be right on point because it is, so similar to the white lotus have either of you seen this movie yeah i have yeah. not yet i'm dying to see it though i saw it this week um think? no Matt. no it, 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 it was it was entertaining it was very watchable but i don't think that a best picture nominee is going to feature people vomiting for 20 minutes well uh, well listen <laughs> maybe it won't but i i just i I loved it. I just thought it was oh, no. uh, an, an incredible movie. I mean, I don't know. I mean, you might be, it might be too far out for the Academy to put it in best picture. Uh, but uh, I mean, Perry, you, you got to see it and let us know what you think. It, All right. It's been on like my, my top uh, to see list. I cannot wait. Now I kind of wanted to get nominated just so it's best picture clip can be just people vomiting. Oh my God. It's wild. All right. So, so what do you think of like, Knives Out to Glass Onion. Uh, that's the next on my list. I do have it. I think that's a, a really expertly crafted murder mystery movie for Ryan Johnson yet again. And I'll bring this up because it's something people kept asking me after I uh, tweeted my reaction to the movie. It's like, well, like, is it better or worse than the first Knives Out? And it's hard to assess that because I've seen Knives Out. I don't even know how many times. And I've seen Glass Onion just once. But my... Like my knee jerk reaction to answering that question immediately after walking out of the theater was like, holy shit, I think I like both of these movies evenly, but for different reasons. He basically takes what he did in the first film and and evolves it and does something different with it. And what what could you ask for more than that in a, a sequel film? Uh, exactly. Jeff, what do you think about uh, Knives Out, Glass Onion being nominated for Best Picture? <laughs> Insane. Why? I think this would be the worst Best Picture nominee maybe ever. Uh, this wow. movie was not good, just like the first wow. movie. Wow. Um, yeah, not an awards movie whatsoever. If, if Netflix is binning its hopes on this movie, Wait, best yeah. did, did you just say you didn't like the first one either? Yeah. Oh, I wow. like the first okay, one. I, I didn't. Didn't I, I didn't see the second one. Uh, but but I've heard good things. Uh, that's why I like... watch on Netflix on a Saturday night. Dot dot dot, and nothing more. <laughs> well, jeez. Huh. All right. Well, let's. What, what about another sequel? But Avatar: The Way of Water, because the first Avatar in its re-release last week and made more than thirty million dollars. Not bad for a movie that is thirteen years old. Perry, you're shaking your head like no way. <sighs> It's just like every single thing that happens with Avatar, it feels like, you know, like the cosmos telling me like, stop writing this movie off. It was, it like had real power back then. It could do it again. But I'm like, Avatar came out in 2009. That was a really long time ago. I'm also one of few people who saw that movie. And I'm like, that's pretty good. But like, I was not blown away by it by any means. And I don't know. I just, I have a hard time thinking that way of water is going to come out and have that same kind of effect. So I'm not going to completely write it off. It's going in that pile of movies right now. You never know what could happen. Again, it's James Cameron. He always kind of surprises in that respect. And maybe I shouldn't yeah, doubt true. him, but right now, I'm still not ready to believe that that movie can get a Best Picture nomination. Well, well, Avatar, when it came out in 2009, it lost Best Picture to The Hurt Locker, uh, which is one of, one of the lowest grossing movies to win the Academy Award for Best Picture, at least prior to COVID times. Jeff, do you think Avatar 2 has a shot at Best Picture? There are two things I've learned during my time in the entertainment industry. Number one, don't piss off Kim Masters. And number two, don't underestimate James Cameron. Those are the two rules in Hollywood. Uh, I think that Avatar is going to get a nomination. I think that, uh, I mean, it almost won, right? The original almost won. It was that that and Hurt Locker, really. Yeah, that's right. Um, so now you're telling me that this movie is going to struggle to get into, you know, a 10 movie field with this crop of movies? Like, no, I think it's definitely going to get in if only, you know, uh, you know, um, pushed by the below the line people and the crafts voting for it and stuff like that. I think the first film was about introducing you to the world of Pandora, but now that he's in Pandora, he'll be able to tell stories. You're introducing kids. 
you know, you're going deeper into the ideas of family and love and things like that. I, I think this is absolutely going to get them. You could uh, be right. I'm very willing right. to admit that you could be right. All right. I agree uh, that, that I agree with Perry that Jeff could be right. <laughs> um, it, of course, uh, uh, Avatar won three Academy Awards. It was nominated for six more, including Best Picture and Best Director. And I do think that, you know, it will be really unusual if we had a Best Picture situation where two of the nominees were sequels that were more than a decade old, you know, being Top Gun and Avatar. But it could happen. You know, it's a whole different world in a post-pandemic or still in a pandemic world. Um, but the Avatar's that, big competition, man, is, is Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, right? Because I, right. I feel like, you know, there is a slot for one of those movies. Is there Are there two slots? Now we may be pushing it. So that's really the movie that it kind of has to like fend off. Right, right. Well, does does Wakanda yeah. forever get in there? Because Black Panther did. It could. It definitely could. The trailer looks fantastic. I do wonder if, you know, without Chadwick in, in, in the movie, is there this sort of gaping void uh, or, or whatever? Or maybe there's even more emotion. Um, but then again, I have to weigh it against all the production stories that I've heard. This was a tough shoot. You know, I, I don't think that that's any secret. There's no mystery there. Right. So because of those rumors, I took it off the list. It, it maybe looks like a little bit more of a conventional Marvel sequel than something that, that's really groundbreaking like the first film, but totally acknowledge that it could surprise and be just as good as that first film, and in which case it would get it. All right. So let's just take a look at, as we start to wrap it up. Like, What what are some of the other films on either of yeah, your lists more. that you think – you okay. think it's absolutely going to get nominated? Oh no, I'm I'm well yeah. past that point. I don't absolutely think anything beyond I think my number three is going to get nominated. <laughs> but uh, the la yeah. the last one that I have on my list at this point in time is the whale, and I've I've grown a little uh, a little wary of that prediction just because I think that the more responses that came out about that movie, the more mixed I saw there. But mm. you know. I didn't get the chance to see it at TIFF because it was one of the most in-demand tickets there was at the festival. And people are really on the Brendan Fraser train right now and very excited for, for him and his work in the film. And I do think that that's something that could potentially bleed beyond the best actor category and nudge it into best picture as well. So that is my number 10 at this point. All right, Jeff. I had it at number eight. Uh, I think a performance like that you know, elevates the entire movie and it has a super emotional ending too. Like the climax is really strong. So you leave the theater kind of like devastated. Uh, and, and I just, you know, I, I'm rooting for Aronofsky to get his mojo back. Um, and, and I think Brendan Fraser just has a great story. So I, I, I think it gets in. All right. So then let's go through our, for wait, our wait, wait. I, I, I can give you my 10. All right. All right. But number 10, I have a, I have a toss up. I think number 10 is going to be a smaller movie. That's going to surprise. Hmm. That's going to be my big theory this year. And so at number 10 right now, I'm, I'm going back and forth between the inspection, which I thought was terrific. Uh, did you, did either of you see that at TIFF? I haven't no. seen it yet. Jeremy Pope's amazing. Um, Elegance Bratton, uh, a great new voice. So it's, the, the inspection, which is an A24 title, but then there's an MGM movie that released a trailer this morning. Till. No. What? And that's Bones and All. Oh, Oh, Luca oh. with Timothy Chalamet, which is different than anything else in the race this year. Um, I've heard it's a beautiful film that it's really uh, frightening and, and, and effective. Um, and so I'm going to make that my number 10. I saw Bones and All at Telluride, and I think it is a cross between Badlands and, you know, it's Badlands with Cannibals is what it is. And, you know, Timothy Chalamet. And it's it's a it's a really interesting film. I don't think it gets into best picture. I just don't think it gets into best That's picture. That's fine. I may say the same thing you know, when I see it. I can't right. wait to see it. But man, man, still is another one that's probably well worth bringing up. Uh, yeah, sure. I thought I thought it was it was quite good, and I'd be shocked if um, Daniel Deadweiler didn't get a, a lead actress nomination. I'm like a little a little more iffy on the best picture chances, but I do think those chances are there, especially depending on how the rest of the year shapes up. With mm. you know whether the movies that we've discussed can can maintain that kind of momentum, and also how good some of the future movies really are so i think that one is one to keep on your radar for now all right so let's go through so we definitely are putting the fablemans at number one we're going to put top gun maverick and everything everywhere next mm -hmm. after those three it gets a little fuzzy so 
are we we're we're putting she said on the list because I know Jeff and I sight unseen definitely think it's a it's a strong strong contender for that uh and then Babylon uh I think the three of us agree sight unseen that it has all the makings all the markings of a surefire best picture nominee am I right about that both both, both yeah each? all right okay and then the banshees of any Sheeran we are definitely putting on the list uh tar we are putting on that list jeff i don't think you liked it but perry i know you did all right so that's uh we got we got one two three four five six seven only seven oh wait eight we're, avatar avatar we're putting on the list it's not on my list but 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 if both of you have it on your list then it makes the cut and, right. and I think women talking, right? Yeah, man, man. So you had women talking as well, right? All right, yeah, women talking. Okay. okay, so that's nine. So we need one more film to make this list. I, I really wish you guys saw Armageddon time, but yeah, Jeff, I mean, did you didn't. say you saw the whale? Yeah, I think I would put the whale. And it, or I have the whale on my list also. So oh well, then there, then that's I think it. That would be it. All right. So for our first pass, wait, wait, first, wait, 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 wait. What? One other one. Did what? two two of us had the woman king also? Yes, we did. I did. But you didn't see I, it. I had it also. Oh, you did have it. I, okay. I haven't seen the movie, but I did include it on my list. But we all, all three of us are going with the whale. Oh, all three of us had the whale. Well, but still, if two of us had the woman king, what other ones did well, two of us put? Because there, there's, a, there's too many movies that have two of us. That's what it is. Right, right, right. Yeah. So we need to figure out how to prioritize those. All right. So does all right. Well, in terms of like the 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 end game, does uh, the whale make the list, or is, does does the woman king make the list? I think it's the whale. Oh yeah, right. I think it's the whale. All right, then, then I, we'll go with the ma whale. Mainly because all three of us have the whale on our list, though. Okay. So number one is the Fablemans. Number two is Top Gun Maverick. Number three, Everything Everywhere. Number four, and this is not in order. This is just so I can keep track of it. Number four is Babylon. Number five is She Said. Number six is Tar. Number seven is Banshees. Number eight is Avatar. Wait, number nine is The Whale. And then number 10 is Women Talking. Is is women talking. Number 10 is women talking. Again, that's not in order preference. That's just so we can keep track of the fact that we have 10, 10 best picture nominees on our very first pass. That is our very first pass of many that we will have throughout the course of FYC this coming Oscar season, which we are now in. So welcome to the Oscar party. Join us for FYC moving forward. For our brand new season, make sure you subscribe to Perry Nemiroff's channel right now so you can be the first to know when we drop a new episode of FYC, as well as all these other shows that Perry drops on a regular basis. If you're not subscribing to Perry's channel, then you're missing out. But make sure you also share FYC on your social media platforms. Let us know in the comments section below what you think of our first pass at the predictions for Best Picture. And we will be back very, very soon with our next episode of Film Oscar Season FYC. So until then, FY, see you later.